So the project started, at least in my head, somewhere in 2018. And I think it was a result of all of the different crises happening in the world, thinking about the political situation in America amidst the Trump presidency, but also, of course, the more global phenomena of global warming, climate crisis, nativist movements, political, economic crises, and all of these things concatenating and building on each other made me feel like we needed to think of new paradigms for exhibition making. And so for me, the genesis of the project was really to think about how can we make exhibitions differently? How could we actually assemble a group of artists with a fiction writer who don't know each other, who are actually unfamiliar with each other and create a new collaborative situation in which together this group would create an exhibition set in the future. And so it made sense that the city that was once Nottingham might actually have a rebirth with a new name and a new future. And so for me, the title encapsulates a lot of what I think art can do, which is again to prototype new ways of living and to think about alternatives that seem just out of reach, but actually that we can act on if we start to practice them in our everyday language and in the actions we bring into the world. The city of Nottingham, as it's going to be in 2094, well, none of us know exactly what it's going to be like in 2094, so this is a kind of thought experiment. But I see it as silver because in the scenario I've written, the Gulf Stream, which as we know is, is responsible for our climate being relatively mild, uh, fails, which it may well do. And so the temperatures are going to be more like Canada now. So it's silver because the Trent freezes and floods every winter and people skate on the ice and it's very beautiful because we do have a problem with our imaginations when we think forward. We're very good at looking back because we've got history to give us all sorts of clues and cues about what went before, but we're not particularly good at looking forward. The invitation of this exhibition is to fast forward, throw your imagination forward into a time, actually it's not that long from now. It's really not that long from now. So the gallery works as a composite work meaning you enter a process of thinking in which certain things cohabit, some made by me, some made by others, but all of them useful, or in fact, absolutely important for me to be able to articulate a way of thinking. So it's a display, it's an exhibition, but it's also an artwork, and it's also a process of thinking. A process of thinking that in a way has accompanied me for the last two years, but you only see the resulting uh, images, the resulting objects of that process. So the new work that I made for the gallery is completely new for me in the sense that I'm not an image maker and I've actually produced three very, very large scale images or let's call them paintings um, that uh, are in, in many ways, they look handmade, but they're actually the result of very complicated, machinic, algorithmic, scripted actions that try and mimic the mimicker. So try and mimic how cephalopods actually mimic their environment and they therefore become part of it. So the images are in some ways studies or resulting studies of uh, an animal that is capable of becoming what surrounds it and therefore cohabit with the world that it's in, in a way that humans are incapable of doing. So all of the things that you see in this gallery are extremely important to me. And they're also really extremely important relationships. Uh, I don't actually know all the artists, but I still have relationships with their work. For example, we have a work of Delphine Rest, who is a Swiss artist I've never actually met. But yeah, I find her work extremely important. I think her practice has been influential to me. Well, and a very important part of the, of the exhibition experience, of course, is the soundtrack. 
the soundtrack, which I especially commissioned from Hannah Catherine Jones, a musician, composer, who I greatly admire. I, I had never worked with her before. This was a really interesting uh, opportunity. I, I asked uh, Hannah to give these images a soul. That was my brief. <laughs> which is why they're called auras, because it is her sound that allows them to talk back. So the spiritual overlay is a concept I came up with um, to think of the building more as a kind of spiritual technology. What does it mean when architecture is embodied? So I came up with this idea and this journey that audience members can take through all the galleries, starting in East, to the south, to the west, to the north, and go through this type of transformation. And so we start with time of change, we go time to understand, time for inner knowledge, and we end with time to transmit wisdom. The piece is called The Temple, and the idea was, to, as I said, to look at traditional architecture. So I looked at also African design, African adobe houses, and I also thought about memories of my grandmother and her house in Kenya, in rural Kenya, that I would visit as a child. And then I thought about different types of architecture, like sweat lodges that I visited, like First Nation sweat lodges in Vancouver, and I kind of wanted to bring that together. Uh, the concept in my gallery is that weather prediction has become a vital activity in people's daily lives in 2094. Um, I was interested in how, for a long time, the weather used to be something that was very um, much part of our daily lives, um, something we could experience with our senses. But with all the kind of, in the recent decades, and the, the research into the global climate has become this kind of um, abstract field that is calculated by computers and very much removed from our kind of um, bodies and um, uh, yeah, daily life. Um, and I think the, the sort of locality of the weather is also something that I'm very much interested in. Um, yeah, the work Wet Spells is an immersive installation that consists of several elements that all kind of um, engage with the weather prediction in a different way. Um, so on the one hand, there is um, a sort of weather notation system that I developed, um, which um, tries to capture different weather phenomena, but it also tries to capture how, by looking at the world around you and, and nature, you can already discover clues and signs that kind of tell you what the weather might be like in the weeks or months to come. Um, and the weather notation system is interesting because on the one hand um, it is a very ancient thing to do, to try to note down and mark observations, um, but at the same time we're also looking for a sort of language that can be um, in the future as well, so it's this kind of hybrid between a sort of ancient and future language.